Hey there, kids. This is chapter 35 of the Oddmeyer book one, The Changeling. The first thing Tin felt was heat. It was not unpleasant, a bit like reaching a hand into a hot bathtub. The warm swirling around his fingers, the second thing Tin felt was that he had fingers. He looked down. Everything was indistinct and blurry, as though he were engulfed in a heavy fog. But he had a body again. A goblin body, sure, but it was his. Somewhere just beyond his reach, he began to hear the rhythmic lapping of the ocean once more. And then a voice, his brothers. He drifted forward. They were there just ahead. He could feel them, but he couldn't move any closer. The invisible string that had drawn him so gently inward had now gone taut. He pulled against it, straining to get back to his family, but the magical tether held him. He glanced over his shoulder where there should have been nothing but open ocean and distinct silhouettes loomed. Gradually, they took the shape of valleys and hills. On the hills, strange creatures lumbered, bound, flew across the alien terrain, with dawning of clarity, Tin realized he was looking into the Anwen. For a brief moment, Tin felt himself drifting toward the fantastical landscape, but then came the jolt again, this time in the opposite direction. The invisible string holding him back from his world did not seem to want him to get too close to the world of magic either. Tin! Tin! The voice was muffled, but he could hear Cole calling him. He watched as if through frosted glass as his brother rushed forward toward him. I'm here, Cole. I'm here. Tin reached out his hand, stretching toward his brother. But Cole was thrown roughly backward out of view, and Tin redoubled his efforts, frantically pulling against his bonds. But the harder he tried, the farther away the earth seemed to drift. And then a grim thought occurred to him. This, is, this was where it had lived. This was where the thing had been born, trapped for an eternity in the thin place between places, a prisoner without a home in either world. His breath came in anxious, shallow gulps. The landscape before him began to fade as if ice were spreading over the window pane. The cliffs vanished into the mist, then the queen, Cull, and finally Tin's mother slipped away. No! Tin cried. Cole was thrown backward, his fingers numb where they had touched the shimmering gap. Chief Ned caught him before he could stumble clear off the platform and down into the choppy waters below. Cole felt like he had been run over by a bull. What happened? You canna go after him, Ned said so soberly. That's the fabric of the universe itself. Well, the universe just took my brother. Get him back. I'm sorry, lad. Tis not possible, even the best of us. The veil gave that changeling to the horde those many years ago, and it seems to be taking him back today. Cole shook. His mouth opened and closed, but he could not speak. Nuts to that, a voice cried. Chief Ned turned his head. Cole looked up. At the end of the platform stood Fable, her jaw squared and her hands clenched in fists. Fable! No! the queen yelled. And then Fable punched the universe. When the last of the goblin cliffs had vanished from view, Tin sagged. He could feel the gentle ebb and flow tugging him toward the Anwen and then back toward Earth. He closed his eyes and let himself hang in the empty space, swaying like a broken puppet. The tug of his chest grew more urgent. He wondered if it would be like this for all eternity, the push and pull, fighting against each other, except it was more than just a tug now. Something had changed. Except it was more, oh, here he is. He felt his whole body being wrenched forward. Tin opened his eyes. A hand, a real hand, had him by the shirt front. 
The mist faded and a pair of brilliant hazel eyes appeared straight at him. Fable grinned. Her grip tightened and she yanked him toward her. Tim could feel the magical current redoubling its efforts. The invisible string squeezing his ribs until he thought they were burst. And Fable pulled. The thin place shook. Tin grimaced against the pain. His bones felt as though they were rattling apart. He clutched the girl's arm tight with both of his goblin hands and Fable pulled again. And then like a clap of thunder, the unnatural fog vanished and the two of them landed on the goblin platform in a gasping panting pile. The cliffs exploded in noise as hundreds of goblins cheered and whooped and threw things into the air. And Fable pushed her hair, dark curls out of her eyes. Well, take that, universe, she said. Hi, Tin. Hi, Tin laughed. You, you saved me. Of course I did. Tin had only just gotten to his feet when he was bowled over again by Cole. And in another moment, they were both scooped up by their mother. Tears once more fell from Tin's eyes. And when he reached a, a, a hand up to wipe them away, he froze, staring at his arms. Hey, you look like you, said Cole. I look like Tin turned his hands over and over and wiggled his fingers. They lost their drab gray and were back to their, their usual dirty pink. I look like me. I mean, I look like you. We look like us, said Cole. Tim glanced up at the goblin chief. How? Nud shook his head, bewildered. Cole clapped his hands. Kin and kin, kind. That's what it says. The scroll says a changeling would turn back to kin and kind when the magic has run its course. Doesn't say goblin kind. That's you lot, then. You're the lads. He paused. His eyes met Tin's and then dropped to the ground. You're the lads' true family. Tin stood dumbstruck. Does that mean I can, I can go home? Chief Nud put a hand on the boy's shoulder. I lad, I believe it does. Well, what do you say? Cole smiled a crooked toothy grin that for all its horrifying angles, Tin was beginning to find rather endearing. I took a midnight trip with you once, long time ago, back when I started all this mess. Would you say I'd take you back again one last time and see it done? And that's the end of chapter 35. And that's what chapter 36 looks like.